Hello everybody. Thanks once again for visiting my YouTube channel. This is a place where we discuss the Lord's Recovery Movement of Witness Lee, also known as the Local Church Movement. I wanted to talk a little bit today about the history of the Lord's Recovery and the progression of the Lord's Recovery or the digression from how it began in this country to where it is today. Basically, the Lord's Recovery went from a fresh, spontaneous, very living, very real experience of the church life and slowly degraded into a stifling movement, which only contained shadows of the spontaneity that existed before. Witness Lee came to the United States in the early 60s. He ended up in Los Angeles and he began to minister there. And from this, he got some followers. The movement began to grow. He was preaching Christ's life and the practical church life. In those days, there was a lot of seeking for something more. Before that time, basically Christianity was denominationalism. There wasn't a whole lot of living, vibrant experience of Christ and the church. People were seeking for something more, and Witness Lee came around and offered something more, which wasn't bad in itself. But movements tend to be both dependent upon and victims of their spontaneity. Much like the hippie movement from which the Jesus movement sprung, it was very spontaneous early on, which isn't bad, but eventually the spontaneity leads to some to think we need to start controlling this thing. We need to start directing this thing. I came in at about 1974. I was 18 years old. I just got saved and I got saved by myself. I didn't get saved in the local church. I didn't get saved anywhere. I got saved by myself, me and Jesus. And I met some Christians on the campus and they invited me to a meeting. So I went to the meeting hall, which then was in a little storefront. I felt at home there. I felt like this is a good thing. This is where I need to be. I didn't know. I was 18 years old. Shortly after, I moved in with some Christians there in corporate living with a couple and some single men living there. I got into the church life, started to participate in it, and that became my life. Around 1975, the life study training started. The first one was Witness Lee teaching on the Book of Romans, I believe. There was also a training on John, later on a training on Hebrews, and eventually he went through the whole New Testament. I wasn't there for all trainings, but I did go to the John training, the Hebrews training, the Romans training, and I really can't remember all the ones I went to. I know I went to some more. But in the beginning, I had been there, I don't know, a long time before I even ever saw Witness League. And we had bought some property and we built a meeting hall there. That was our home and that was our life. And we knew each other and we had relationships with each other and we were just enjoying the church life. But after a while, we heard that Witness Lee was going to be coming to visit. And what's interesting is when we heard that, they decided to renovate the meeting hall. We had to paint. We spruced it up for his visit. I thought, why are we doing so much just because this guy's coming to see us? Well, Witness Lee came, and I was somewhat impressed by him, and I realized he was the guy. He's the guy who was leading this thing. As time went on, we had more conferences and more experiences. Along about the late 70s, as I said, there was a lot more spontaneity then, a lot more openness to maybe the Lord will do something different. It wasn't always coming through Witness Lee. Maybe it'll come through somebody else. We had what you might call the youth movement. It was the Young Galileans movement, and it really started with Witness Lee. He was always pushing for more excitement and more passion and more outward movement and growth. He said the young people are the key, and they are young Galileans, because all the apostles were young Galileans. John and Peter and Andrew and them, they weren't old guys, they were young guys. And so we had the Young Galileans movement. And even one brother wrote a song based on a popular song. And when we are the young Galileans, young Galileans, you know, 
it was real popular. And we had these meetings and conferences where we'd all jump up on the chairs and dance and things like that. But finally, Witness Lee decided it was too much. The young people were going too crazy. They were doing too many crazy things. And he said, I gave the keys to the car of the Lord's Recovery to the young people, and they drove it into the ocean. He says, I'm taking the car keys and I'm putting them in my pocket. And that was about the time that Max Rappaport was beginning to have some problems with Philip Lee and his having fornication with anybody he wanted to in the Living Stream Ministry office, which went on for another 10 years. Witness Lee started to clamp down on the movement. After that, things began to be more and more organized in an authoritarian manner. And right about that time, they started to have in the trainings for the young people, the full-time trainings in Anaheim. And after that, people began to be a lot more regimented and a lot more serious and lacking humor. Brother, are you one with the ministry? And this kind of thing. And I went off to college in another city, and we actually started a church there. But I was getting a little older and I was getting disillusioned with the kind of life I was expected to lead there. Eventually I left, had a lot of issues separating myself from the movement. And actually I came back one time. And when I came back a few years later, I noticed that the life had ebbed, the sense of hopefulness and innocence had left. There was more people that were disillusioned with the movement It just slowly started to become something that was less and less attractive and less and less desirable. By the late 80s, when the stuff came out with John Ingalls being concerned about Philip Lee and so forth, I was out. I was out for good. It was a tough time because I basically grew up in the Lord's recovery, in a sense. I mean, I came there when I was 18. And I was a very naive young person. I really didn't have much life direction or philosophy except what I got from them. So it took a long time for me to build up a new philosophy. Over time, as I watched the movement and went on with my own life, it became more and more this thing of following Witness Lee. And Witness Lee is the one true minister. In the late 80s, there was a brother who was a elder, and he came out and said, I don't think we should follow Witness Lee exclusively. Now, this was in a day when they said, you don't have to follow any one ministry. The local churches are autonomous. But when he came out and said, I don't think we need to follow Witness Lee's ministry exclusively. He didn't say we don't have to follow Witness Lee. He said Witness Lee exclusively. They shut him down. They said, you cannot teach this. He resigned from the eldership. And so the movement basically became a movement of Witness Lee and of following Witness Lee. In their minds, he was the only guy to be followed, and so that's what they did. Over time, it became more and more about simply echoing Witness Lee's ministry. And I lost track of it a lot and went on my own way. And continuing to try to figure out what it was about, I went on and eventually rekindled my Christian life. But I've always been curious about what it was about. I mean, that's kind of my thing is like, what was that all about? What happened? What was that all about, God? What were you doing there? Why did it seem so good, but it went so bad? What does that mean? What is the church? What does it mean to follow you? What are you trying to do? Why did these things happen? And I wanted to understand that. And it's attractive to me just in my personality to discuss those things and think about them. And it wasn't tearing me up or anything. I had my life, but I still wanted answers. I wanted to understand what happened. I eventually got married, had a family, was successful financially, and so forth. But I was still curious about it, and I began to get online, and the Bereans website started with the local church discussion, and eventually local church discussions was created, and I was very involved in that formulated some ideas, and many of them are the ones I hold today, it was always very fascinating to me what this is all about and how these kind of things happen and how they go wrong. What was really going on here? That has informed my opinions about everything. And the conclusions I've come to, I've shared with you on this YouTube channel. In history, this kind of thing happens. People are seeking God. 
They're seeking something more than what they see out there. People are always seeking, seeking, seeking. It's a good instinct. It's good to be seeking. But we latch on to things, and then those things tend to become too organized and too ossified, and then somebody decides they're in charge of the thing. Somebody decides they're the ones that have the right to tell everybody else what to do. They're the apostle. They're the co-worker. They're the person who's in charge. They're the person that's been commissioned. And you need to follow us and you need to do what we say. That's really not the way it works. The way it works is you need to follow God. Do you need to know other Christians and fellowship with other Christians? Yes, you do. And that's the church. The church is fellowship. The church is being involved in other Christians. The church is not necessarily being involved in an organization, though it often is. And organizations get a bad rap because it's easy to do that. And they do tend to go wrong. But any meeting is an organization. I mean, if you have a scheduled meeting time, you've got organization. So the idea that it's organic, you know, in the sense that it's totally spontaneous is ridiculous. Obviously, you have organization. But then we say, you have an organization. Well, okay, where do you draw the line about what's organization and what's organic? Well, you have to know yourself. You have to know what makes sense to you. You have to know what God's telling you. What I saw... The conclusions I've come to is that this has happened again and again and again in history. And it's not because God fails, it's because we fail. It's because of our tendencies. It's because of our tendency to do what? To stop listening to the voice of God and start listening to the voice of people. And really it comes down to not knowing God enough ourselves. And so God is real. Jesus is real. His grace is real. All these things are real. But the idea that there's some kind of movement that you need to get into so you can fulfill your purpose in this thing, that might be helpful and good for a while, but you need to recognize when it goes bad. And when it goes bad, if you can't fix it, then you need to move on. Ironically, this is exactly what recovery is. This is exactly what happened in the United States In the 60s and 70s, when the Lord's recovery came along, is it was people saying, I want to get out of religion. I want to get into something new and fresh. The Lord's recovery decided that it's always new and fresh here, which it isn't, which nothing is. They eventually became ossified. They eventually became religion. And it's totally proper for you to say, you know, it's time for me to move on. It's time for me to move on. It's not time for you to leave God. That's not right. But it may be totally time for you to move on. People that left the Baptist church, people that left Catholicism, people that jumped into this amazing thing that was going on in those days and enjoyed it, that's good. But where we go wrong is thinking this thing's going to last forever. It's not. God's kingdom lasts forever. The church lasts. But organizations and movements come and go. They come and go. God's always moving. Children of Israel went through the wilderness. They didn't stay in the same place. They weren't always in the same terrain. They weren't always by the same lake. They didn't always have the same organization of their tents and everything. They were always changing. They were always moving. And they got into the good land. Eventually, Israel became kind of corrupt. That's just what happens with human beings. And this is what God is doing. He's working with human beings. So if you think that there's going to be some perfect movement or some perfect move that you're going to get involved in, and it's going to go on to the end, and you can never leave it, and it doesn't need to change, doesn't need to improve, that is absolutely contradictory to historical experience. It does not happen that way. What happens is things can be good for a while and then things change and God moves on. And the important thing is to follow him. Don't get disillusioned. Don't get too attached to a movement. Hang on to your relationships. Hang on to your friends as much as you can. But don't get attached to a movement because God is always moving. And if we're not ready to move with him, We're going to be left behind with the people that are just tending to something 
that God has left behind. And that's where the Lord's recovery is now. That doesn't mean that he doesn't show up for their meetings and bless them. God loves his people. But these guys are doing something that's 40 years old. They're back then. I saw a video. Monero Chin was talking about the growth of the Lord's recovery. And how they had this explosive growth in the first 10 years. And then leveled off to about 3% a year. Which is basically a flat line, he said. And he was pushing for this great revival. And I have never heard a more dull, less hopeful exhortation, if you can call it that, to a revival than his. I mean, it's like the words were falling off the end of his tongue. We need a revival. Oh, I just wanted to tell him, this was in 2018 when he gave this. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. Who's going to be revived by that? Who's going to be revived by this meeting where these people are sitting around boringly singing about eating Jesus and then they march these people out to give these canned testimonies of agreement with the move that seem half-hearted. And then Minoru Chin gets up and starts talking about we need a revival. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's not going to happen. So if you're in the Lord's recovery and you're disillusioned, guess what? God's probably telling you to step out. And you might say, well, I'm 50 years old. I've been in the Lord's recovery 20 years. What am I going to do? It's your choice. You want to stay there and be in the status quo and be bored and be unfulfilled in your life? Stay there. God is always calling us to something more that we're not prepared for and we don't think that we can handle. Guess what? That's what makes it exciting. If you're on a roller coaster and you know everything is going to happen and there's no surprises, are you going to enjoy that roller coaster? No, it's the surprises that make it exciting. Well, that's the way God does things too. That's the way our life is. So step out. Step out. Recovery? I believe in recovery. But I don't believe in that movement because there's no recovery there anymore. And just like the people that were bored with denominationalism in the late 50s and the early 60s, people are bored with the Lord's recovery. It's the same thing. It's even worse because they try to hold people there. But so did the Baptists. So did the Catholics. This is age old. It's age old. Don't leave us. You'll be in trouble if you do. It's age old. Just move on. Go to something fresh. Look at the next hill and say, what's over that hill? I want to go there. And go there. Just go. Go. Who knows what you might find? Don't cheat yourself. Don't sell your life to a movement. I hope this adds up. Thanks for listening. Take care.